This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Thanks for letting me do this for so long. So, young people, what does it mean exactly for something to go hard? I've bought bread before, and I left it out on the kitchen side, and it went kinda hard. Is that what we're talking about? No, I get it. I own a Google, and something going hard is just a fancy way of saying that it's doing its job well. It's a good example of that one thing. If anything, it maybe leans more towards something going so well that its qualities kind of outshine other examples. Listen, I've heard it used a lot to describe music, but today I want to talk about moments in video games that are so good and so amazing that it tickles that small part of my brain that really likes it when things are working perfectly in front of me. It's not so much amazing game design or like competent voice acting, it's caveman brain stuff, you know? If you do know, let me know all about your favourite moments that go hard in a comment below and make sure you tell me how wrong my definition is. I don't know what I'm doing. JRPGs are probably the single genre that punches above its weight with awesome moments. At times it's kind of hilarious how jarring the contrast is between unbelievable peak storytelling and then the slightly awkward application of turn-based combat over the top of this. Like you'll have characters who are ready to rip each other's throats out but hold on! But you can only fight each other one turn at a time, you gotta keep it fair, you know? And I'm not gonna sit here and say that no moments in JRPGs go hard because they obviously do, but for my money there needs to be a stronger connection between premise and gameplay. You need to feel awesome and have the gameplay reflect that, and to that point I raise you one piece of music. Alright, so let's talk Xenoblade Chronicles and how music can have more than one meaning and how despite the jarring difference between the two meanings, they can complement each other pretty fucking perfectly. The music is You Will Know Our Names and it plays when you encounter a unique monster in Xenoblade Chronicles, a specific classification of regular enemy that is either slightly stronger with modified stats and abilities, or just an enemy that is ridiculously stronger than anything around it and it's this second version that is more likely to be your introduction to this particular particular piece of music. You hear that awesome intro, you wonder why new music is playing out of nowhere, and then you either scarper away from an enemy that can one-shot every member of your party, or you just die. It is the perennial oh shit music that overrides whatever other music is playing at the time to tell you that life is now a lot more complicated. However, the same music plays regardless how much stronger these unique enemies are, which means that if you mean to encounter one of them, perhaps later in the game when the level difference isn't so bad, You Will Know Our Names goes from being a terrifying herald of death to being an ooey gooey dose of serotonin that hypes you up for what are so often the hardest optional challenges in Zelda Blade Chronicles. There are 157 unique monsters and this loop is so effective that it never truly stops going hard every time. It's kind of addictive, not gonna lie. Xenoblade Chronicles makes a good point. The right kind of music for the right moment can take a cool moment and boost it to become one that goes so hard that it can punch a hole in the fabric of space and time. Hi-Fi Rush was always likely to be the sort of game that not only uses music really well, because that's kind of the whole point of the game, but also knows the perfect timing for a needle drop and what kind of song needs using. Unfortunately, I can't just show the cafeteria fight in full because the music playing in the background is a little ditty called Invaders Must Die by The Prodigy, which is simultaneously a certified banger, but also copyrighted to hell and back. So hopefully this remixed version I found goes at least some of the way towards replicating the effect. On a very basic level, the cafeteria fight in Hi-Fi Rush is pretty much an awesome scenario with a similarly blood pumping soundtrack. You've been launched through a window into an area where a large group of enemies are just chilling out on their lunch break and naturally they're pretty pissed off that they now have to drop everything and deal with this shit now. Poor guys probably only get half an hour a day and they spend most of that queuing for their pizza which is like £4.50 a slice so I understand why they're annoyed. So yeah, from a shallow perspective, this level works because the action is good and the music is good. But don't forget that Hi-Fi Rush is a rhythm action game where you are rewarded for doing things on the beat. Invaders Must Die has such a distinctive beat that not only is it quite easy to time hits to the beat, but it feels pretty fucking awesome to do so. 
This whole scene happens at a point in Hi-Fi Rush where you're probably feeling fairly familiar with the mechanics and can take a challenge like fighting a room full of enemies. And for sure, it's hardly like Hi-Fi Rush is going easy on you by doing all of this, but this level is both difficult for what it's asking you to do, but by mastering the combat system, it can be a breeze. And I tell you, beating this stage without being hit is unbelievably satisfying. Sometimes, game design really is that easy. These won't all be music related, it's just that sometimes the right kind of music can do wonders for how you remember an already pretty cool part of a game. But hey, we need some variety, so we'll pivot to something a little bit different. Nintendo games are sleeper hits for moments that go really hard. Maybe it's because you never truly expect them, because they're marketed at kids, and kids haven't quite developed a taste for moments that could be album covers in the right universe. By the same metric, Zelda games are quietly amazing at this, despite being relatively understated adventures for the most part. You only have to look over most of the fights with Ganondorf to realise that when they really need to, Zelda games can produce some serious fireworks. I did think about putting basically anything from the Ganon fight in Tears of the Kingdom and the ever-expanding health bar makes a very convincing argument. Where is it going? In the end, I thought about it a little more and decided that you've got to go with the classics and sadly, we live in an age where the Wind Waker is considered a classic now and I'm now old and sad and just... Oh god, so old. Since Wind Waker looks like a cartoon, all of the characters are capable of emoting a lot more than in previous Zelda games, and this already holds a ton of potential for Link to do all manner of awesome things. Nintendo also made Link a lot more agile for some reason, so now he's equipped with all sorts of rolls and flips to help him parry enemy attacks in just the flashiest way possible. The developers were able to bring both of these characteristics into the final battle with Ganondorf in the best way possible, since not only do you feel a lot of drama since the facial expressions are working over time, but the primary way of damaging Ganondorf in the fight proper are these acrobatic parry attacks. Which is all fantastic, we're simmering away real nice, but we still need to build to something for the finisher, and don't worry, they've saved the best for last. I'm sorry, but... This is so rude. Oh my god, it's so rude. Ganon, buddy, I feel legitimately so bad for you. This parry attack, which is 100% what this is, by the way. Here it is in black and white and actual black and white. Sure, why not? This parry attack does not usually go like this. It's usually the roll behind the Dark Knight and cut the strings attack, but I guess we've got a small amount of the overhead helm splitter parry in there too. What I'm trying to illustrate for you is that at no point previously in Wind Waker did Link demonstrate that he had anything like this in his locker. He has never shown a move of such undiluted savagery before. He has fucking buried that sword in Ganon's head. That thing is touching brain, and honestly, that feels like something out of Mortal Kombat. FATALITY I know there's some symbolism of, like, slaying this beast man and the Master Sword so often ends up in Ganon's head, but you basically never see it stay there. There's no question of whether the fight is over or not, Ganon now has a sword lodged in his brain. Wind Waker Link is a quiet psychopath, and I love it. If there was ever a franchise that has made a name for itself from a love of spectacle, it would have to be God of War. This wasn't always the case. The older games made headlines less for their spectacular set pieces or their historical accuracy to Greek mythology, and more for a level of hyperviolence that I don't even think I can show on YouTube in current year. But damn, even with all the blood, there was a real focus on showing you set pieces and scenarios that you simply hadn't seen before these games came out. Like, climbing the body of a titan who's like the size of a skyscraper? Never seen that before, haven't really seen it since. The newer games have mostly ditched the over-the-top gore, and the spectacle is a little more subdued, but that means that any big moments stand out so much more. And as soon as God of War Ragnarok started to tease Thor being in this game, you can kind of see where they were heading. Thor is basically the perfect foil for modern Daddy Kratos, who serves as both an equal in terms of stature and ability, but also as a pretty significant point of contrast, since Thor hasn't undergone his self-reflective arc and is still big destructive warmonger guy. 
So naturally, these two butt heads, because there will be riots in the streets if they didn't, and it's as wonderful as you could possibly imagine. Big hits from both guys and lots of smack talking, especially from Thor, but the singular moment that goes the hardest isn't when their two weapons collide in midair and they just calmly walk around them, although that's as good a second place as we could hope for, holy shit. Nah, because there is but one even better moment that comes from an initially annoying bit of button mashing which only becomes even more irritating since you need to mash really fast to not be instantly killed by Thor. But hold on a second, this is all scripted and you're supposed to fail and die because Thor fucking goddamn revives Kratos from the dead with Mjolnir so that he can slap him around some more. You are fighting a boss that just brought you back to life because you died too soon. That is so unreasonably cool that I didn't really know what to do with myself when this happened for the first time. Do I keep fighting Thor? Do I go up to him and shake his hand and say, fair enough, bro, whatever you say? There's no real playbook for what to do when your boss fight revives you just to beat the shit out of you again. I hope to see it again so that I may one day learn what to do. I wish they gave out training for it. You will struggle to see a protagonist as restrained as Samus Aran. It depends on the game, of course, since Metroid Other M gave her more lines than the rest of the franchise combined and made her borderline insufferable to listen to, but generally speaking, she's got this Terminator vibe where she turns up, blows up some aliens, and then leaves without saying a word. Most of the time. It is phenomenally effective at characterizing Samus without force-feeding you quote-unquote cool moments, and this kind of effortless aura is continued nicely with Metroid Dread. This game worked really hard for Samus and gave her the kind of main console outing that she has needed for more than a decade, but Dread was also ambitious enough to give her room to try new things. Samus speaking Chozo is not something that I thought I'd ever see, but it makes sense given her history with the Chozo, and how the main bad guy is Chozo, and how she literally has Chozo DNA inside her. However, it's the Metroid DNA that is so important in Metroid Dread, and this becomes a large point of contention in the final battle, a fight that Samus initially does well in before she gets cutscene nerfed, and now Ravenbeak is choking the life out of her. What happens next, honestly, sent me to the moon. So this may initially look a little less crazy than some of the stuff we've talked about, but I need you to understand just how unexpected and bonkers what we just watched truly was. Samus going ham has become somewhat of a feature of Metroid games. The rainbow lasers from Super Metroid immediately come to mind. So the end result of Samus staving off death and ultimately defeating the bad guy isn't what's so unbelievable here. It's the savagery, it's the loss of composure that has followed this character for so long. Any sense of Samus having this calming level of control over the situation has been shattered by a fucking war cry and a really violent counter-attack. There's parallels here with the end of Wind Waker, and while this isn't as shocking as that, it is still surprising to see a Nintendo character with this much rage going on. Like, imagine Mario unleashing a blood-curdling scream as he curb-stomped Bowser. That's kind of what we're working with here, and it is so effective. You can't do this again. I hope we all realize that. Anyway, those are the moments that go really hard in video games. Do you agree? Or is there something else you'd have at number one? Let me know in a comment down below. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it, subscribe for more, and hit that bell for notifications of every new upload. My last video was about crazy exploits, so make sure you go watch that. And I also want to thank my top sports on Patreon, including Sarah Malion, The Green Scorpion, and Scott Riker. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.